Tonight on CCO, several Gopher fans are arrested after filling the streets of Dinkytown. Police made their presence known. We get some insight as to why events like this happen. A gunman is accused of targeting Jewish people on the eve of Passover, killing three. What he said as police took him into custody. And it's been a chilly weekend, and now snow is on the way. Will it be enough to shovel? And there's a place in Minnesota where sinkholes are common. Does it make you nervous if I do this? It doesn't make you nervous. Don't make me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> we have a sinking feeling you'll enjoy tonight's Finding Minnesota. And now, from Minnesota's most watched station, this is WCCO 4 News. Good evening, I'm Mike Binkley. And I'm Angela Davis. Thank you for joining us. One night after a big disturbance in Dinkytown, officials are assessing how the situation was handled. Police arrested 19 people after crowds filled the streets. This came after officers issued warnings to clear out following the Gophers' loss in the Frozen Four. There were reports of people throwing bottles. You saw one there. One car had its windows shattered with a street sign that was torn down. Many of those arrested were ticketed and released, but at least four current or former U of M students were booked into jail. Kate Raditz was there covering the disturbance last night, and it was quite a scene out there. It was, Angela. Everything really escalated fairly quickly, but at no point did chaos break out. We've reached out to police, but right now they are not commenting on last night's events. At first, Gopher fans were tame following the team's loss. But nearly an hour later... Suddenly, that all changed. I haven't like experienced something like this. It's weird. Hundreds of students flooded Dinky Town streets. <laughs> That's when police on the ground in the area. and on horses dressed in riot gear lined up, forming a wall blocking Fourth Street. They ordered students to leave. So they are letting students know. They mean business. We were there as police began using tear gas or pepper spray to break up the crowd. They also fired what looked like a beanbag launcher into the crowd. There should be riots here. There should be people on the street. They're going a little excessive right now. What do we expect? We're not trying to flip cars, burn cars. Let's come on. Let's be real. There were two reports of arson and several broken car windows. 19 people were arrested. Don't know what to think. It, it seems worse than Thursday and we didn't even win. University officials had warned students even bystanders would be at risk for arrest. Many students couldn't return to their homes for several hours until police cleared the area. Oh my God. They said the police response was unfair. It's a little over excessive because we're all just trying to have fun tonight. And we're not rioting. Nobody's rioting. Officers say all the methods they used on the crowds were non-lethal. As far as damage, though, Minneapolis police said there was an undetermined amount of property damage from what we saw last night and today. Businesses did seem to be okay. And Kate, you mentioned the university. I mean, they issued some strong warnings before any of this happened that right. any kind of violent activity like this would not be tolerated. So what's the university saying about, you know, this video, what they saw? Yeah, well, for the most part, the students listened. The university, they released a statement today sort of putting it in perspective that there are roughly 50 55,000 students at the university and only a couple hundred were in Dinky Town last night and much less than that engaged in any destructive behavior. So most of them seem to heed that warning. All right. Thank you, Kate. Mm -hmm. Well, meanwhile, at the small college that won the game, it was a different scene. Here's a look at the crowds around Union College in Schenectady, New York. Police estimate fewer than 500 fans celebrated in the streets after their team's win. They put up barricades to give students a place to gather. Officers only broke up the crowd when a handful of people started throwing full beer cans at empty bottles. Five people were arrested there. Now, alcohol clearly played a role in some of the behavior we saw last night in Dinkytown. But what else could have prompted them to throw bottles at police, set a couch on fire, or vandalize a car? We talked with an expert in social psychology at the University of St. Thomas. WCCO's Holly Wagner shares his thoughts on what happened. Saturday night's go for loss in the national title game brought out a rowdy group of fans and onlookers in Dinkytown. In the midst of dozens of officers armed in riot gear, our cameras caught people crowd surfing, chanting USA. One guy mooned police and got tackled. 
You know, I don't think it's as much a spontaneous celebration as Thursday's was, as much as it was uh, sort of this voyeuristic. A lot of the people, I think, wanting to see what would happen. Despite repeated warnings from the U of M and police, hundreds of people showed up. John Tower says for some, it was about exercising their right to be there. So I think anytime people hear you can't be on the street, I think there's a certain element where students are thinking, why not? We're not breaking the law. We're the good ones. You've told us don't riot. We're not rioting, but we certainly have a right to sit here. For others, it was a chance to get attention, taking a selfie in the middle of the action, or posing next to a SWAT officer. Narcissistic trend that we're headed uh, where any attention on social media is oftentimes seen as positive social attention. He says while things clearly got out of hand at times, it was far from out of control. You need to leave the area. Was it more unruly than a typical Saturday night in Dinkytown? Absolutely. Was this a full-fledged riot? No. A tower believes the measures put in place by the university and police kept the situation from getting worse. We have much more video and information about last night's events on our website, WCCO.com. More than 300,000 Minnesotans will see bigger paychecks this fall. The legislature passed a bill raising the state's minimum wage. By 2016, it'll go up to $7.75 an hour for small businesses and $9.50 an hour for large companies. Smaller gradual raises go into effect in August. Starting in 2018, the wage will go up every year with inflation. Governor Mark Dayton will sign the bill into law tomorrow afternoon. A man accused of shooting and killing three people in Kansas was reportedly shouting anti-Semitic remarks while being arrested. The shootings happened this afternoon near two Jewish affiliated facilities in suburban Kansas City. A doctor and his 14 year old grandson died outside the Jewish community center. They were reportedly Christians. A woman was killed at a Jewish retirement community a mile and a half away. Now here's the alleged gunman, a man in his 70s. The local Jewish Community Relations Council issued a statement today. It said in part, this shooting is a stark and painful reminder that no place is a haven from violence and hatred. A man who came close to being elected governor is now the endorsed candidate to replace Michelle Bachman in Congress. Tom Immer is a former state representative who was edged out by Mark Dayton in the 2010 governor's race. Immer got the Republican Party's endorsement for Congress this weekend and the support of Representative Bachman. That will give him an advantage in the strongly conservative 6th district. As for Bachman, the big question is, what will she do after she retires from Congress in January? She talked with WCCO's Esme Murphy this morning. In her nearly eight years in Congress, Michelle Bachman has risen to the status of conservative icon. A founder of the Tea Party, for a brief time she was even the front runner in the 2012 race for the Republican presidential nomination. But her presidential campaign fizzled, and it later became the focus of an investigation into campaign finance violations. She says she will be cleared of any wrongdoing. Later in 2012, she barely won re-election to her House seat in an overwhelmingly Republican district. But for conservatives, those bumps don't diminish her star status. At a tribute dinner in Monticello this weekend, conservative icons and celebrities, including John Voight, Newt Gingrich, Glenn Beck, and Sean Hannity, appeared in a video hailing her leadership and asking her to remain on the national stage. So what exactly is Michelle Bachman going to do next? I asked her when she appeared on WCCO Sunday morning. Well, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to continue to remain involved on the national stage because the issues are so consequential. And I'll be involved in shaping the debate. I'll be involved in a number of different areas, whether it's individual campaigns or just speaking nationally. I intend to do a lot of speaking and probably I'll be involved with media as well. Bachman did say she is not planning another run for president and has not yet decided who she might endorse in the presidential race. She also has another eight months before she leaves her seat in Congress. You can watch WCCO Sunday morning with Esme Murphy and Matt Brickman every Sunday at 6 a.m. and 1030 a.m. Pope Francis surprised the crowd following today's Palm Sunday Mass. He went off script, then got swarmed. We'll show you the unusual move he made after today's service. Plus, you think potholes are a problem? We visit a Minnesota town that's known as the sinkhole capital of the U.S. And Mark is here with a preview of Rosen Sports Sunday. Official, the Minnesota Wild will open the playoffs, Stanley Cup playoffs, Thursday in Colorado. We'll chat with Kevin Gorg of FSN North to preview the opening round of those Stanley Cup playoffs. 
and the one and only common man of KFAN Radio, Dan Cole, will weigh in on Bubba Watson's second Masters Championship today. It's all coming up on Sports Sunday right after the news. All right, thanks, Mark. Be sure to stay with WCCO 4 News. Today is Palm Sunday, the final Sunday of Lent and the beginning of Holy Week. This morning at the Basilica of St. Mary in Minneapolis, parishioners carried palms into the church. Today marks the time Jesus entered Jerusalem and followers laid palm branches in his path. Thousands of pilgrims traveled to Bethlehem in the Vatican to mark the occasion. Pope Francis decided to speak freely off the cuff this morning instead of reading his prepared homily. And after mass, the Pope jumped into the Pope mobile and went out into the crowd, even posing for a few selfies. He was having fun. How about that? Well, with Easter a week away, a lot of families take pictures with the Easter bunny. But that can be difficult for families with children who have special needs. <laughs> well, today the caring bunny helped ease those concerns. The folks at Southdale Center in Edina created a special environment for those kids. There were activities for kids while they waited for pictures, and the mall made special accommodations to reduce sensory triggers. Well, despite the late discovery of underwater signals, the search for Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 is more complicated. Search crews say the signals have now gone silent, meaning the batteries in the plane's black boxes likely died. Once officials are confident no more sounds will be heard, a robotic submarine will be sent into the depths of the Indian Ocean to slowly search for wreckage. Investigators are still trying to determine where exactly the plane went down. A busy metro highway is set to reopen following a week-long closure. MnDOT, weekend-long closure, I should say. MnDOT closed Highway 62 between Highway 100 and 35W in Minneapolis, Edina, and Richfield. Crews knocked down the Xerxes Avenue Bridge. The highway will reopen by tomorrow's drive to work. Well, many towns in Minnesota take pride in their oversized attractions. Yeah, you may know about the world's largest leather boot or ball of twine or ear of corn. The list goes on and on. But how about the town whose claim to fame is the number of spots where the ground has collapsed? Tonight, we walk carefully through a beautiful but somewhat unstable part of our state as we go finding Minnesota. When I'm out here mowing stuff, I'm always watching the ground to see if anything opens up. Minnesota is known for its 10,000 lakes, but down in Fillmore County, there are 10,000 holes in the ground. Sinkhole capital of the United States. And proud of it. Doggone right, we're proud of her. The town of Fountain claims this unusual title, and it has to be one of the few places with an observation deck. We got people coming in all the time looking at sinkholes. They've, a lot of places they've never seen one. There are plenty of them here because of the soluble rocks like limestone beneath the soil. Over time, water works through the cracks underground, erodes the rock, and the soil caves in. Does it make you nervous if I do this? It doesn't make you nervous. Don't make me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> They're fairly easy to spot in fields around town. Once the ground collapses like this, there's no real use for it, so big clumps of trees take over. Any place you look out in the field and you see trees growing, it's a sinkhole. It's an extra challenge if you're trying to farm the land. Right there, there's another one down there. Like Mike Schwartz and his son Jason. You can't even go one pass through the whole field without hitting a sinkhole and have to turn around 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So you just have to work around them. Yeah, usually what we do is just when we get to one, we just go around it. They're there, so you just got to deal with it, and we're used to it. As far as anyone can remember, no buildings have been swallowed up in town but some of the deeper holes do provide a history lesson. They were using the sinkholes as dumps for many, many decades. College students have conducted digs in some of the older sinkholes. So what are these? These look like they go back a ways. Those are the boot cream bottles, the Cavalier boot cream bottles. One generation's trash is another generation's artifact. Fountain only has about 400 people, but because of its somewhat shaky ground, it has a solid sense of place. I think everybody else is proud of our sinkhole capital of the United States. It's quite a thing to watch Mother Nature, what she can do with our ground. Now that title of sinkhole capital of the U.S. is unofficial. In fact, many people call the state of Florida the sinkhole capital of the world, but no one has objected to Fountain using that designation. If you have another idea for a place we should visit, Finding Minnesota, let us know by going to WCCO.com links.
Despite the chill in the air, it's happening. Signs of spring are emerging this weekend. The change of seasons is marked with the first official ice out. The DNR declared an ice ice out on at least six lakes in southern Minnesota late this week. While many of our lakes in the metro area have areas with open water, it'll likely be another week or two until they are completely ice free. Starting tomorrow, burn restrictions will be in place in central Minnesota. The orange and yellow co colored counties you see here show where the DNR says the danger is greatest right now. Now, the restrictions are expected to be in place for four to six weeks. Tell you what, I stepped outside this morning and 42 degrees uh, felt so cold to me. Yeah. You can tell we've changed now. We've I know. Two steps forward and then one step back, and then we'll take a couple more steps back as oh. we head into yeah. the next couple of days, unfortunately, with some cooler weather, weather settling in. And today, high temperatures in the middle 40s. So, yeah. And to add to that wintry feel, snow. Snow falling across southeastern Minnesota this evening, and that will continue overnight tonight and possibly some record cold in the metro Tuesday morning that could set a record dating back to the 1930s and even more snow in the forecast and possibly shovelable snow in the forecast for the metro. So if you're still watching and you haven't changed the channel, we'll get into all of that coming up right now. This is what we know right now about that midweek snow. The storm system is going to be moving in and across the area. It will be moving rather slowly due to a high, a strong area of high pressure across the east coast that's going to cause that system to move slowly. So it is setting the stage for possibly some significant snow for parts of the state right now. It looks like potentially central Minnesota and possibly measurable snow for the metro. But of course, as the time frame nears, we'll get more and more specific as far as those locations and snowfall accumulations. What well, the timing looks like right now, some metro snow showers developing Tuesday night, mainly rain and mixed during the day on Wednesday and then transitioning back to snow late day Wednesday and Wednesday night. But for right now, we do have snow on the radar with this wide reaching band of moisture across parts of Wisconsin right now. Nearly everyone seeing some form of precipitation and that snow continuing to fall across parts of southeastern Minnesota, as has been the case throughout the evening where you see those purple returns. That's going to indicate that heavier snowfall right now, which we do have falling across Houston County, Fillmore County, Winona County as well. Snow continuing to fall in our weather watcher in Iota reporting about a half an inch of snowfall as of about an hour and a half ago. So adding to that tally right now. Also, Howie and Goodhue, our weather watcher, about a half an inch of snowfall. And then you're seeing more adding to that with the secondary band that has kind of redeveloped. You'll notice that over the last two hours, that snow just building up and now falling from Ellsworth, Wisconsin, down into Redwig, Cannon Falls, Northfield, and Faribault, seeing some snow falling at this time. As far as snowfall accumulations for the rest of the overnight period, see about the most three three inches and that will be across parts of extreme southeastern Minnesota as we look ahead towards tomorrow morning. It will be that heavier snow because temperatures are in the middle 30s right now in southeastern Minnesota. We're in the mid 30s in the Twin Cities and with these winds gusting as they have been all throughout the day into the middle 20s gusting to mid 40s across southwestern Minnesota. It is going to be chilly. That wind continues into the morning 28 degrees as we wake up in the metro, but it's going to feel like single digits because of that wind possibly gusting up to around 20 miles per hour. And as we head into the next couple of days, you're really not going to like too much what you see. 38 degrees, our chilly high temperature for tomorrow. That will be our first 30 degree high since April 1st. A little better for Tuesday, except for that start at 18, which would tie a record. But the winds will be lighter Tuesday morning and then that system to watch on Wednesday. But hey, in the long range, it looks mild for Easter. Okay. There's that. <laughs> we'll take it. That's a week away. But... Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Sure. It is playoff time for the Minnesota Wild. Yeah, they had one more game tonight at the X. Could they finish the regular season on a high note? A lot of fisticuffs, you can see. Mark Rosen up next with highlights. Now, the Toyota Sports Desk. Visit your local Toyota dealer today. All right, Marcus here, and we're starting with hockey tonight. Yeah, relaxing situation really for the Minnesota Wild. They just want to stay healthy tonight and get on with it because this is what it's about the second season, the most important one. Tonight's regular season finale for the Minnesota Wild against Nashville at the X served only as a tune up for the Stanley Cup playoffs, which will begin next Thursday in Colorado against the Avalanche. Well, the Wild showed some early spark. In fact, when Zach Parisi scored his 29th goal in a nifty pass from Mikko Koig, the Wild led 3 to 1, but they pretty much folded up their tents the rest of the way. Nashville is out of the playoffs, so they had their fun as the period wore on. Peppering goalie Ilya Brzgalov, three quick goals. 
gave them a five to three lead. Pretty much no defense the rest of the way. They went on to win it seven to three, but this one has already been put in the old dumpster. It's time to look ahead to the start of the Stanley Cup playoffs. The first four games, the playoffs begin, as I mentioned, Thursday in Colorado. Both of them are 8.30 starts, then game two Saturday also in Colorado. Then returning home a week from tomorrow, the 21st, 6 o'clock start that night. And then Thursday, the 24th, that's just the first four games. It's the best four out of seven series. I think they proved that uh, when they uh, uh, they didn't obviously make the playoffs, and now you're uh, uh, second seed in the Western Conference. So uh, I think that's all you uh, you really need to know uh, the way that the steps that they've been taking uh, this year, and, and uh, so obviously it's, it's a huge challenge for us. And um, again, going back to that, we got to prepare the right way and, and be ready for uh, for game one. The Twins' first home stand could not have finished better after three straight Target Field losses to Oakland. The Twins. Completed a three game sweep of the Kansas City Royals scoring a couple of unusual eighth inning runs to beat them this afternoon four to three after six scoreless innings twins catcher Josemil Pinto got the fat part of his bat on this pitch and just like that the twins had a two to nothing lead Kevin Correa pitched seven shutout innings continuing a huge turnaround this weekend but the Royals rallied to take a lead what a bizarre way to win it Wade Davis the pitcher made a wild throw home looking for a double play instead not only the tying run scored but look at here. Brian Dozier's heads up base running allows him to score the go ahead goal and I mean run when things start going your way. Yeah I can't recall seeing a game end like this either. Casey's Mike Moustakas popping one straight up but he doesn't move. He stared at it. Catcher Kurt Suzuki tripped over him so it, it didn't really matter. The ball fell harmlessly but Moustakas was correctly called out for interference. The Twins win it four to three the final. They're back to 500 at six and six. They have the day off tomorrow. Toronto's here on Tuesday night, and here's manager Ron Gardenhire. Well, it's, it's about winning, winning series, winning ball games, and uh, you know that's a nice one. That team has handled us pretty good the last couple of years, and it's a good young baseball team over there that can do some things. So, uh, uh, as we talked about before the game, taking care of our home field and getting back to winning baseball here is really important for us. Well, it didn't take long, and the final round of the Masters turned into more of a match play event between 20-year-old Jordan Spieth and. Bubba Watson and that's the way it ended without any real drama winning by three shots. Jordan Spieth had a two shot lead going into the eighth hole but he missed a short par putt on eight to drop him to seven under par. There was a four shot swing during these two holes. Spieth going bogey bogey Watson countering with two birdie putts and he was never really challenged the rest of the way. Bubba said he was on cloud nine after winning here two years ago and all the commitments took him out of his element for a spell. His experience though down the stretch made the difference and after tapping in here yeah wonderful moment as his son greeted him eventually here on the 18th green Aww. and was soon thereafter Bubba was wearing his second green jacket. <laughs> Here's a look at the final leaderboard uh, Watson winning by three shots over Blixton Spieth uh, Miguel Jimenez uh, with four under Ricky Fowler two under Matt Kuchar shooting a 74. Again, it's a dream to uh, to have my family here and to win. You know, just to have my family here is a, is a blessing to be able to to do that. They can travel with me, um, and then to put on another green jacket while they're here, it's pretty crazy. And the Timberwolves are in Sacramento, and this is the final week of the regular se season. Sacramento just won the game 106 to 103. Kevin Love with 43 points and 11 rebounds for Sacramento. Demarcus Cousins had 33 points, 14 rebounds, six assists. The Kings beat the Wolves 106 103. Two games left for Minnesota. Right now they're sitting at 500 at 40 and 40. A lot coming up in Sports Sunday. Kevin Gorg from the XL Center talking more about the uh, playoff possibilities for the Wild against the Colorado Avalanche and the common man in here to talk Masters and Twins. Good Sweet. show. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Rosie. All right, so this is kind of like the polar plunge, but a little more extreme. See how folks in Alaska are saying goodbye to winter. This is next. Here in Minnesota, many people pride themselves on being bold enough to jump into a frozen pond. But in Alaska, they do it with a little more vigor. This is one way to blow off a bit of cabin fever. This event is called the Slush Cup. It's held at the beginning of spring near Anchorage, and skiers race down a hill one at a time with the hopes of having enough speed to glide oh. across a chilly 90-foot pond. We saw one person do it, <laughs> so it can be done. Yeah. Silly. So you're talking about some some chilly weather ahead. Yeah, chilly tomorrow, wind chills in the single digits.